Good morning. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here uh, this morning, uh, my colleague from Arizona as well, other members as they appear. This subcommittee has recently held a number of hearings on countries, chiefly Pakistan and Afghanistan, where terror runs rampant and our national security interests are generally perceived to be significant. Now I'd like to paraphrase a brief introductory paragraph in a recent article printed in The Economist magazine. It says, in recent months, the people of a certain country have become inured to carefully choreographed spectacles of horror. Just before Christmas, the severed heads of eight soldiers were found dumped in plastic bags near a shopping center in the capital of a state. Last month, another three were found in an icebox near a border community. The country's president states that organized crime is out of control. He's pitted 45,000 army troops against the drug traffickers. But in 2008, more than 6,200 people died in the country in drug-related violence, more than twice the number killed in 2007. More than 1,000 people have died so far in 2009. Troops and police have fought pitch battles against drug gangsters armed with rocket launchers, grenades, machine guns, and armor-piercing sniper rifles such as the rifles such as the Barrett 50. The article does not describe Pakistan or Afghanistan. It's a story about our neighbor to the south. Mexico, the world's 12th largest economy, the United States' second biggest trading partner, and an important oil supplier. The former drug czar, General Barry McCaffrey, says the picture there is dangerous and a worsening situation that fundamentally threatens United States national security. Last month, Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano said, Mexico right now has issues of violence that are a different degree and level than we've seen before. Some most, notable, most notably President Calderon, dispute such a grim picture, but few, if any, contest that matters are certainly serious. The Economist article notes that the drug industry is worth some $320 billion a year, a figure I note some of our witnesses agree with, and that the United States alone spends $40 billion each year trying to eliminate the supply of drugs. The Attorney General Medina Mora is quoted in the article as noting that of 107,000 gun shops in the United States, 12,000 are close to the Mexican border and their sales are much higher than average. Thousands of automatic rifles are bought for export to Mexico, which is illegal. Now, when they're talking about exporting rifles out there, they're talking about weapons such as the one we see on the table there, and they're firing ammunition. This is what we use uh, when we're fighting, our troops are fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq. This is what the gangsters and drug people are using when they fight Mexican and United States police and so, uh, national security people down along the border. In addition, cash is moving from America to Mexico. So today, this Committee on National Security and Foreign Affairs focuses on this increasingly urgent national security challenge, one that's not halfway around the world, but one that's quite literally at our doorstep, the increasing violence along the U.S.-Mexico border. And that violence is increasingly spilling over into United States soil. The United States Justice Department called Mexican gangs the biggest organized crime threat to the United States noting that they operate in at least 230 U.S. cities and towns. Phoenix is now the United States capital of kidnappings, with more than 370 cases last year. The city sits a stone's throw away from Ciudad Juarez, where more than 1,550 people were killed in drug wars last year. Border violence is receiving increased attention by the United States government, including by a number of committees in this Congress. At those hearings, I'm sure the Merida initiative will be discussed along with other efforts by the United States to strengthen Mexican police and judicial institutions. I'm sure questions will be asked about what the United States can do to ensure that this violence does not spread from south to north. I'm sure there will be calls for our southern neighbors to get their house in order. But all of this is just one part of the equation. Today's hearings ask the central question, are there laws and activities on the American side of the border fueling this violence in Mexico? According to the United States Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, 90 percent of the guns confiscated in Mexican organized crime originated in the United States, 90 percent. And we're not just talking handguns and hunting rifles. William Newell, special agent in charge of the ATF station in Arizona, noted, for example, 18 months ago we saw a spike in 50 caliber machine guns heading south. According to those ATF statistics, more than 7,700 guns sold in America were traced to Mexico in 2008, twice the 3,300 recorded the previous year, and more than triple the 2,100 traced the year before that. And how do Mexican cartels get the money to buy those guns? 
The Woodrow Wilson Center put it this way, profits from drug sales in the United States pump roughly 15 to $25 billion every year into illicit activities in Mexico. In short, United States drug use creates billions in illicit profits that are then used by Mexican cartels to buy U.S. guns. The profits in the guns and drug precursors in some cases find their way back across the border to Mexico and fuel the increasing violence. This is a vicious cycle that we simply must break. Our kids, our schools, and our neighborhoods are quite literally at stake. And United States national security and the stability of our southern neighbor also hang in the balance. This subcommittee has conducted and will continue to conduct extensive oversight into the volatile situation in South Asia. But last month, the Wall Street Journal article concluded, much as Pakistan is fighting for survival against Islamic radicals, Mexico is waging a do or die battle with the world's most powerful drug cartels. The parallels between Pakistan and Mexico are strong enough that the United States military singled them out recently as the two countries where there is a risk the government could suffer a swift and catastrophic collapse. Here are the words of our own United States military. They say, in terms of worst case scenarios for the United States joint force and indeed the world, two large and important states bear consideration for a rapid and sudden collapse, Pakistan and Mexico. The Mexican possibility may seem less likely, but the government, its politicians, police, and judicial infrastructure are all under sustained assault and pressure by criminal gangs and drug cartels. How that internal conflict turns out over the next several years will have a major impact on the stability of the Mexican state. Any descent by Mexico into chaos would demand an American response based on the serious implications for homeland security alone. As the Obama administration and Congress and the American people increasingly pay attention to the violence in Mexico, my hope is that we not only discuss the Merida Initiative and other efforts to help our southern neighbor, that we not only ask the Mexican government to get its house in order, but that we also look inside our own borders, that we look to our own drug consumption, to our own drug, to our own drug consumption, to our own gun laws, and to our own anti-money laundering initiatives, and ask what more we can do, what more we can do on our side of the border. My hope is that this hearing will result in some concrete recommendations for the United States Congress to consider. We'll hear from top experts who have examined and studied these issues, and we greatly appreciate all of their presence here today. United States-Mexico border violence can only be solved if we looked at all parts of the equation, if we examine everything that's fueling the fire. Let's examine our gun laws. Let's explore ways to cut down on U.S. drug consumption. Let's ask if we need more resources to root out money laundering. The peace and well-being of both of our countries and both of our peoples depends on it. And with that, I, I yield to the ranking member, Mr. Flake, for his comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a representative of a border state, uh, this, this uh, subject hits a little close to home, so I'm glad that we've called this hearing. I look forward to hearing the witnesses. In recent years, Mexican towns bordering the United States have experienced exponential growth in violence. The fighting, chiefly the result of drug cartels warring with each other in the Mexican government, have cost 7,000 Mexican lives this past year alone. President Calderon is making a concerted effort to quell the violence. It does not, however, that the hostility will cease in the near term. On the contrary, reports indicate that this violence may be spreading. Despite conflicting reports about how, lo these large, how large these cartels actually are and whether the violence has already spilled into the U.S., violence in Mexico is a serious issue that is ripe for this subcommittee's review. The purpose of this hearing is to examine ways in which the U.S. is fueling the violence. In other words, uh, we're looking at ways to explore ways where we can be blamed. The, witness will testify, the witnesses will testify that America's insatiable appetite for drugs and accessibility to weapons are the source of the violence. While I agree that cross-border sales of guns and drugs play a part, I do not believe in stricter, that stricter gun controls on Americans and public, and public service announcements will solve the problem. Indeed, we need to open a discussion on a broader sp spectrum of ideas. First, the U.S. must focus on enforcing good laws on the books. In my home state of Arizona, it's illegal to directly or indirectly sell weapons to criminals, plain and simple. The same is true under federal law. Instead of punishing law-abiding Americans with stricter uh, controls, we need to punish those who break the law today. In fact, 
U.S. law enforcement has had tremendous success in this regard. This Tuesday, a senior Immigration and Customs Enforcement official testified before another congressional committee. She said that in the last three and a half years, ICE has made a concerted effort to focus on border security. In this period, the agency has made 4,830 arrests and seized nearly 170,000 pounds of drugs and captured numerous weapons at or near the border. State operations are also working. Now, I believe that the enactment of comprehensive immigration reform would also make it easier uh, for the legitimate movement of workers on a temporary basis, and, and as well as goods between the United States and Mexico. This would free law enforcement officials to focus their resources uh, and to be more direct on the pressing crimes that potentially endanger our citizens. We must determine the extent to which U.S.-funded anti-drug programs are succeeding in Mexico. To date, we've spent billions on that effort. But instead of limiting the discussion to gun control and treatment programs, we must face, we must uh, have a broad discussion uh, of ideas. To that end, I've invited uh, Arizona Senator Jonathan Payton to testify today. He's come a long way, and I appreciate that in a short, with short notice. He is a, a seasoned legislator uh, in Arizona, and he's a lifelong resident of Arizona. He's thoroughly familiar with these matters and a leader in promoting legislative solutions to the cross-border issues. Thus, Senator Payton provides a unique perspective about ways in which border states, such as Arizona, are tackling these important issues. We can agree that despite our best efforts to fight cartel operations on both sides of the border, violence has gotten worse. That said, serious dialogue must take place between lawmakers and experts about real solutions that bolster security while protecting our rights. Anything less is counterproductive. Sadly, this hearing appears to be more of a discussion about stricter gun controls on Americans than it is about punishing those who break the law. In these discussions today, we need to take care to point out that Mexico is not a failed state, as national rhetoric might suggest. I believe that such characterizations are unhelpful at a time when our friends are going through tough times. President Calderon has taken bold steps to rid his country of corruption. I applaud his efforts and wish him every success, and I think we all should. But I thank the chairman for holding this hearing, and uh, it, it has a great effect on, on my state of Arizona and also the security of the United States. And I look forward to the witnesses. Thank you very much. The subcommittee will now receive testimony from the panelists before us today. As I mentioned in my remarks, there are other committees in this Congress that are, of course, uh, looking at this uh, matter from another perspective. People are dealing with the Meridar Agreement, cooperation between the countries, and uh, what other actions are taken on the uh, national security and law enforcement side. Uh, this is a hearing on yet one element uh, and one uh, view of something additionally that can be done in cooperation uh, with Mexico and will be followed, we presume, by a, a hearing with some of the administration's people on what is actually being done and planned to be done by this administration. Uh, we're going to receive testimony from three individuals whose biographies I'll read in brief uh, right now, four individuals, I should say. Uh, Mr. Andrew Saley. Dr. Seeley is the director of the Woodrow Wilson Center's Mexico Institute, which recently published the January 2009 report, The United States and Mexico Toward a Strategic Partnership. Dr. Seeley is an adjunct professor of government at Johns Hopkins University and previously taught at George Washington University. He serves on the board of the United States-Mexico Fulbright Commission and on the Independent Task Force on Immigration of the Council on Foreign Relations. And I'm happy to note that he's also worked as a professional staff member here in the United, in the United States House of Representatives uh, previously. Mr. Michael A. Brown is the managing partner at Spectra Group International and is a former Drug Enforcement Agency Chief of Operations and Assistant Administrator. As such, he was responsible for leading the worldwide drug enforcement operations of the agency's 227 domestic and 86 foreign offices. In June 2003, Mr. Brown was detailed to the Department of Defense and served on special assignment in Iraq as the Chief of Staff for the Interim Ministry of Interior. Mr. Brown has also served from 1971 to 1973 as an infantryman in the United States Marine Corps. Mr. Jonathan Payton is a member of the Arizona State Senate. He founded a political consulting firm in Tucson called Payton & Associates and has worked with numerous clients in state and local races as well as on initiative campaigns. He also volunteered for active duty in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom from September 2006 until February 2007. Mr. Tom Diaz is a senior policy analyst for the Violence Policy Center and is author of Making a Killing, The Business of Guns in America. His new book, No Boundaries, Transnational Latino Gangs and American Law Enforcement, will be released later this year. 
Mr. Diaz has a distinguished past, including having consulted with the Justice Department and having also worked in the House of Representatives as counsel to the Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on Crime and Criminal Justice. I want to thank all of you for making yourselves available today, Mr. Payton, for your travels at the, at the last minute and for sharing your substantial expertise. It's the practice of this committee to square in all of the witnesses, so at this time I ask you to please rise, raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will please indicate that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. All of your uh, written statements, which have been introduced and read by the members already, will be put on the record in their entirety. So I uh, it, welcome you to give whatever uh, oral remarks you want to give. We try to limit it within five minutes if possible. We don't have a trap door to make you disappear if it doesn't happen that way, but we do like to keep it uh, as close to five minutes as possible so members will have an opportunity uh, to engage and ask questions and get more information in that respect. So if we can, uh, Andrew, Mr. Seeley, uh, appreciate your comments. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee. And thank you also for choosing a subject that is both timely and an approach that I think is very constructive. And let me also, if I can recognize the ranking member also as someone who has taken a courageous stand on a number of issues as well, including immigration, which you referenced in your, your remarks. Good to be here with you as well. Um, the issue of organized crime tied to drug trafficking in Mexico is timely. We've seen in the past year over 6,000 deaths tied to uh, drug trafficking uh, in Mexico. This is something that grabs headlines. It's something that uh, is raising concerns on both sides of the border. Uh, granted, much of the killing is going on in three cities in Mexico. Majority of the killings are going on. A majority of the killings are taking place among people involved in, in drug gangs. But the deeper issue that's going on is the presence of organized crime undermining rule of law in Mexico. And that's something that's very hard for a democratic society to tolerate and something that is of great concern to Mexicans. Um, the Mexican government has accurately defined this as the country's greatest threat, and they've taken a valiant stance against organized crime um, while also trying to strengthen police and judicial institutions in Mexico. And I would argue that is probably the longest term challenge in Mexico is creating judicial institutions and police forces that, that are really have credibility with, with citizens. Um, this issue is particularly constructive the way that it's been designed by this committee and by the chairman because Mexico matters to the United States. And it matters to the United States, and this issue particularly in Mexico matters to the United States, not just because Mexico is our neighbor, which we've talked about. It's a question when something happens of this magnitude in a neighboring country, it's clearly it's important. Um, we have a 2,000 mile border together. Um, it's not merely important because Mexico is a strategic partner in the hemisphere, which they are. It's one of our, our second largest market for exports. It is a partner in a number of endeavors that we have around the world but also because this is an issue where we are deeply implicated, in which we are both deeply involved. Um, organized crime does not know boundaries. Drug trafficking is an issue that is binational and indeed multinational. Um, drug trafficking organizations in Mexico are nurtured by the appetite for narcotics on this side of the border, as the chairman has noted. U.S. drug sales account for as much as 10 to $25 billion each year that is sent back to Mexico to fuel violence and to support the cartels. Some of these proceeds are additionally used to buy weapons for drug trafficking organizations, usually in U.S. gun shows and gun shops. And so when we see the violence across the border and its deeper consequences for democracy and rule of law in Mexico, one of the things we need to recognize is that our country houses those who knowingly and many times unknowingly finance and equip organized crime organizations that is behind it. And that means we also hold the key to at least part of the solution for this problem. Clearly much of the work needs to be done in Mexico, but clearly we're implicated as well and there's much we can do to be supportive and, and that we should be doing. Fortunately, law enforcement cooperation between the governments of the United States and Mexico has increased significantly in recent years. We're now able to track and apprehend some of the worst criminals involved in the drug trade as they move from one country to another and to share timely intelligence that helps disrupt the operations of drug trafficking organizations. This was not necessarily true 10 years ago. There's a degree of cooperation that I think we would not have talked about, we would not have been talking about if we'd had this discussion 10 years ago. The approval by Congress of the Merida Initiative last year has further deepened this cooperation by strengthening contacts and building trust between the two governments to address this common threat together. However, the most important efforts that the U.S. government could take to undermine the reach and violence of these drug trafficking organizations need to be taken on this side of the border. And I want to underscore that. Though there's much we can do, the Merida Initiative is important, there's much we can do to help Mexico. The way we can be most helpful are things that we can do here that we'll be talking about on this panel. Um, there are three sets of actions that we could pursue more energetically that would be especially vital to undermining the cartels. And they're all things that we're doing now, but that we could be doing slightly differently and much more energetically. 
All of these actions are in our national security interest because they will help stabilize the situation in Mexico and prevent any spillover into the United States, but they're also good domestic policy because they would make our communities in the United States safer and more secure. And I'm going to make reference to three things that come out of this report. Uh, the chairman has already referenced it, the United States and Mexico towards a strategic partnership. We put it together with 100 specialists from the United States and Mexico over the past year. And, and so these ideas are as much belong to other people as to me, but I will try and represent them here, the three points. I mean, first, we can do a lot more to reduce the consumption of drugs in the United States. Um, the demand for narcotics in this country is what drives the drug trade elsewhere in the hemisphere, including Mexico. There is no mal magic bullet to do this. I mean, as much as we can say this, there is not a single strategy that is effective in doing this alone. And I also do not claim to be an expert on prevention and treatment of addictions. Other people know this better than I do. However, even, even a cursory look at recent federal expenditures on narcotics show that we have increasingly emphasized supply reduction and interdiction while scaling down our commitment to lowering the consumption in the United States. Available research suggests that investing in the treatment of drug addictions may actually be the most cost-effective way to drive down the profits that drug trafficking organizations get from, from their business and reduce, by reducing the potential market. Um, there is some discussion also, I think it's positive to hear that the new uh, director designate of ONDCP is also thinking along these lines, also talking about things like alternative sentencing for first-time nonviolent offenders. These are the kinds of things that should be on the table for discussion. And although many drug prevention programs have marginal effects on usage, and, and we should be honest, a lot of the, the things that have been tried in the past to keep people out of drugs have not always worked as well as they should. Um, there's a lot that we can learn from very successful campaigns recently against tobacco use, which have been very effective. And it suggests that this is a good time to take that knowledge and invest it actively in prevention once again. Um, we cannot eliminate drug use or addictions, but it's worth taking a concerted effort to drive down demand, not only for public health reasons, which would be enough, of course, but also because it hurts the bottom line of criminal organizations. Secondly, we can do much more to disrupt the 10 to $25 billion that flow from drug sales in U.S. cities back to drug trafficking organizations in Mexico and fuel the violence that we're seeing. The Treasury and Justice Departments have done a great job of making it difficult to launder money in financial institutions. However, the drug trafficking organizations have now turned to shipments of bulk cash, uh, which have become the preferred way of getting their profits back across the border. Currently, no single agency is fully tasked with following the money trail in the way that the agencies are tasked with pursuing the drugs themselves. CBP, ICE, DEA, FBI, Treasury, and local law enforcement are all part of this effort currently, but all are primarily tasked with other responsibilities. It is worth noting that it is both impractical and undesirable to try to stop this flow only at the border, something the ranking member will appreciate. Massive sweeps of cars exiting the United States from Mexico would disrupt the economic linkages between the border cities and probably yield few gains, since much of the cash is divided up and taken across the border in small amounts. The real challenge is developing the intelligence capabilities to de detect the flow of money as it's transported from one point to another in the United States as cash, or when it enters financial institutions as money transfers, foreign exchange purchases, and bank deposits. We're much better at the second than at the first. There are recent experiences in pursuing terrorist financing that may be useful models for similar efforts to pursue the finances of drug traffickers. And third and finally, we can do much more to limit the flow of high caliber weapons from the United States to Mexico. And you'll hear from Tom Diaz on this much more eloquently than, than I can say it. But most of the high caliber weapons, probably more than 90% that are used by drug trafficking organizations are purchased in the United States and exported illegally to Mexico. The first thing that's vital to do is to increase the number of ATF inspectors at the border and to strengthen cooperation with other law enforcement agencies, which often have relevant intelligence on this. Uh, the current prosecution by Arizona's Attorney General of a gun dealer who is knowingly selling arms to drug trafficking organizations is a powerful precedent, but it's only a first step. Um, the Obama administration, and it shows that the state of Arizona is taking this very seriously, but clearly this is something that needs a range of agencies to be supporting the ATF and local law enforcement. Uh, the Obama administration could also limit criminals' access to inexpensive assault weapons by restricting the importation in the United States of some of the high caliber guns currently favored by traffickers, which has driven down their price in the market. There is much we can do to limit the access that criminals now have to high-powered weapons without violating the spirit of the Second Amendment or harming the legitimate interests of American hunters and gun enthusiasts. Thank you. Mr. Silly, I'm going to stop you there only because I know the rest is uh, just a wind-up. And, yep, and having exactly. read it, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you for your comments. We're going to go, if we can, to Mr. Brown, and uh, you're recognized, sir. Good morning, uh, Chairman Tier Tierney, uh, Ranking Member Flake, other distinguished members and staff. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here. Uh, this morning, I'm, although I entered the private sector on November the 1st, I spent 34 years in law enforcement, uh, the last four of which uh, were as the chief of operations with DEA. Uh, as you know, DEA, ICE, FBI uh, have got a lot of folks that are serving, a lot of employees that are serving uh, in Mexico, working shoulder to shoulder with our counterparts, and I lost a lot of sleep over the last three or four years um, as this uh, 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 as the violence began to, uh, to escal escalate and un unfold and escalate uh, throughout Mexico. 
Now, I appreciate your interest in this subject. Um, uh, what, what I hope to do today is answer three questions. What's really going on in Mexico? Uh, what's, what's causing it? What's behind it? And then finally, uh, and I think most importantly, uh, can Mexico win? What's, what's going on? Um, there's a real drug war playing out in, uh, in Mexico. You mentioned some of the numbers earlier. They're appalling. Over 6,000 homicides uh, this past year. Uh, 530 law enforcement officers, Mexican law enforcement officers, were murdered in the line of duty in Mexico last year. 493 of those were drug-related homicides. Uh, for God's sakes, over 200 beheadings. Um, uh, many of those with, with messages uh, attached, messages, notes scribbled on paper, stuffed in the mouths of those, of those victims, are carved in the foreheads, uh, basically uh, um, um, uh, uh, warning police that they needed to show more respect to the, uh, to the traffickers. But what's really behind it? Um, <clears throat> the cartels responsible in Mexico for this, this violence have, were finally swept up in the perfect storm uh, beginning about four years ago. They began, uh, which is not untypical, it's happened many times in the past, uh, but uh, there were some turf wars that, uh, uh, that flared up uh, in various regions throughout the country as they began fighting and vying for lucra lucrative uh, um, uh, plazas or lanes uh, across our southwest border. Uh, about two years ago, shortly after President Calderon uh, took office, <clears throat> he initiated his campaign. Uh, to break the backs of the cartels. I believe that not long after he took office, or possibly even before, he and his uh, advisors, security advisors, uh, uh, determined very quickly that if they didn't uh, take on the cartels in a meaningful way, uh, they were going to lose control of the country, uh, that, uh, that, that the country was literally spiraling out of, uh, out of control. So that added even more pressure uh, to the traffickers. They're fighting amongst themselves. Now they've got the government on their back and the government is relentless, uh, taking, to the, taking the fight to them in a large way. Over 45,000 military troops supplementing the ranks of federal law enforcement, local and state law enforcement. It's a real fight going on. About five years ago, uh, DEA initiated what, uh, what we refer to as the financial attack strategy. We began reverse engineering every one of our cases. We did well for many years following the drugs, but we mandated, mandated that agents uh, uh, reverse engineer every one of their cases and begin following the money. Uh, uh, tremendous benefits. In 2007, I don't have the 2008 figures for you, but in 2007, uh, the DEA seized about $500 million in cash that was destined for the southwest border. Over $900 million cash globally uh, that year. Much of it was tied to Mexican drug trafficking or organizations, um, adding more pressure on, uh, on, these, on these cartels. The, the, uh, an, another strategy uh, that was employed almost simultaneously was the drug flow attack strategy, working very closely with Admiral Jim Stavridis at Southcom, uh, Vice Admiral um, uh, Joe Nimick at Giatif South, uh, we started attacking the soft underbelly of the transportation infrastructure within these organizations uh, and brought every uh, possible uh, uh, piece of equipment to bear against these groups as they move their drugs uh, as they as they move their drugs north. Consequently, enormous amounts of drugs have been seized over the last three years behind that strategy. So when you add that revenue denied in, now we're up to about three, somewhere between $3.5, $4 billion uh, that we're denying these guys. <clears throat> All of this has caused the, the, the Mexican cartels to incur a great deal of debt with the Colombian cartels that are providing all of the cocaine uh, to them that they're now responsible for trafficking into the United States. And the, the Colombian cartels basically uh, over the past years are over the past year have denied time and time again uh, uh, drugs on consignment. They're now demanding money. The bottom line is the cartels in Mexico have never experienced this level of persistent, sustained pressure. It's well into its uh, fourth year now, and really in a meaningful way, uh, the last two years. So the question is, is can Mexico win? There's no doubt Mexico can win. And I use Colombia as an example. Thanks to you and your colleagues, uh, through sufficient funding to Colombia, 
you know, Colombia just a few years ago was facing the same levels of violence in that country that Mexico is facing today. With funding from the United States and expert uh, advisors uh, that are working with our Colombian counterparts, they have turned the tide. If you look at what's happened to Mexico, or excuse me, Colombia in the last three years, their numbers of all their index violent crimes have plummeted. There are kidnappings for ransom, their homicides, their home invasions, their armed robberies. It's a success story. Um, there's a, still a great deal of, of drugs flowing out of, uh, out of uh, 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 Colombia. It, uh, uh, quite frankly, it, it hasn't uh, slowed down one single bit. But, but the truth of the matter is, is Colombia, the government now has solid control of that country. And I'm convinced that the Mexicans can experience the same thing if they don't throw in the towel, if they hang in and continue to fight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, Senator Payton. Thank you, Mr. M Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I want to thank you for inviting me today, and uh, special thanks to uh, Congressman Flake for, for uh, having me come here today. Besides being in the State Senate, I'm also the chairman of the uh, Arizona Senate Judiciary Committee, and I represent the Tucson sector of the, uh, which is considered to be the most trafficked uh, portion of the, of the uh, border with Mexico. I represent that I-19 corridor in East Tucson, Green Valley, and Sierra Vista. When Congress began sending us more Border Patrol agents and customs officers to Arizona, it helped slow some of the illegal immigration activity. But unwittingly, however, it also created a backlog of federal immigration cases. Those immigration cases quadrupled, and what that means is that ATF, which has been diligently investigating gun-related crimes, which are already on the books, such as straw purchases and gun smuggling into Mexico, has been unable to bring many of those cases forward. The U.S. Attorney's Office is swamped with misdemeanor immigration cases, and there are not enough prosecutors, judges, agents, and jails to handle what is coming before them already. How can we expect them to handle new laws. The bottom line, in the words of a, of a federal agent that I spoke to this past week in Arizona, the U.S. federal court system in Arizona is crumbling. And new laws will hasten that process, not help it. The solution, give us more agents, more prosecutors, more jail cells, public defenders. In short, give us the infrastructure to handle the problem. The laws on the books can be investigated and prosecuted. We can go after gun-related crimes now that are seriously impacting Mexico's gun problem. Besides the fact that the actions being taken by gun smugglers are already illegal, many of the weapons themselves are illegal as well. I wasn't able to bring my own prop today because I couldn't make it through the airport with it, but had I done so, I would have brought grenades that were produced in South Korea. I would have brought AK-47s. I would have brought M-16s. Weapons and munitions that are already illegal in the United States that are being smuggled into Mexico from outside of Mexico. Mexico's gun problem is primarily a Mexican border security problem. Let me describe to you the process to get into the United States from Mexico. You go through a, a long line at the port of entry in Nogales. You wait at a, at a, at, in that line. Finally, a customs official meets you. He talks to you, looks at your car, looks at the size of the vehicle, et cetera. Finally, you get through. You go all the way through that, that checkpoint, and 20 miles up the road at I-19, you, you have to go through another border checkpoint with the Border Patrol. In order to get into Mexico, I go down to Nogales. I park at, at McDonald's, and I walk through a turnstile. Essentially, we have an entire border security infrastructure on our side of the border, and they have the same technology that you would use to get in to see your local movie at your movie theater. <coughs> Mexico needs to have their own similar infrastructure that mirrors the United States as much as possible. And the reason I bring this up is that the smuggling problem in the United States, our people smuggling problem, is their gun smuggling problem. The same people that are bringing people and drugs in the United States are the same ones that are being, bringing 
cash and guns into Mexico. This ultimately means is that we need to focus on our own border security problems, not only to guard against those entering the United States illegally, but to interdict those going into Mexico. As long as traffickers can move freely into the United States, they can easily go back into Mexico as well. To show how interrelated this problem is, I just want to refer to the auto theft problem in Arizona as a perfect example. Auto theft in Arizona is one of the biggest per capita crimes for auto theft in the United States. We are finding that a lot of these cars were going south of the border into Mexico, so much so that the, the Attorney General in Sonora called our Attorney General and said, you know what, we've got all these cars littering our roadsides that are abandoned from the United States, from your state. We'd like to get records on them to repatriate them back to the United States. And the reason why is that the Mexicans would steal the cars in the United States, they would use them to haul drugs or haul cash and guns into Mexico. They didn't do this because they liked the American cars, they used them as simply as transport for their own smuggling operations back into Mexico, whereupon they would simply leave them there. If you want to know what we can do, we can increase the, the uh, license plate leader, readers on I-19 that go into Mexico as an example. When they did that, they found that a lot of these cars were stolen. They were able to stop them at the border, and when they looked at the cars, they found, they found money and they found guns inside those cars. The other thing we can do is look at comprehensive immigration reform, as has been advocated by Congressman Flake, which will allow us to focus on the real problem at hand, which is the, the smugglers and not the people that are trying to find gainful employment in the United States. I sit on the Council of State Government's Border Legislative Conference, and I recently returned from Tampico, Tamaulipas, Mexico last weekend. The Mexican government is undergoing a complete and total transformation of their judicial system. They are going from their, their present system into an adversarial system of justice like we have in the United States with a prosecution and a defense. And this means that they will be following the rules of evidence and criminal procedure. And as they do that, they will need corresponding crime labs, ballistics tests, etc., that we use in the United States. The U.S. is uniquely situated to train emerging leaders in Mexico's nascent justice system on forensic science. These efforts will pay off not only in terms of giving the Mexicans the ability to go after gun traffickers in their own country, but more importantly, it will give us access to those databases and intelligence of who these people are that we can use. Criminal cartels do not respect borders. They simply use these borders as a sanctuary from one government over the other, and they game that system in order to have um, continue their trade. I want to close by, by telling you this story. I, I recently had a chance to visit a drop house in Phoenix. And you'll notice that it's, the, that it's a drop house in the neighborhood simply because it's the only place on the block that has razor wire around the perimeter of the fence. Having visited one, I would have to say that it is the modern landborn equivalent to a slave ship. Forty people shackled in a room big enough to be a child's bedchamber. They sit naked on the floor so they can't run away. The room next door is a room used to torture and rape Mexican citizens to extort more money from them. This is not a drop house problem, however. It's not a drug problem, and it's not a gun problem. It is fundamentally a border security problem. Both America and Mexico must secure the southern border. And to do that, we need to enforce our existing gun and immigration laws. We need to provide a workable guest worker program, and we need to give our law enforcement the resources to effectively prosecute existing gun laws. And finally, we need to help Mexico develop a criminal justice system that follows the rule of law. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Diaz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and other members of the committee for allowing me to present the views of the Violence Policy Center, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan group working to reduce the effects of gun violence in America. Uh, the, the hearing today posed the question, money, guns, and drugs are U.S. inputs fueling violence on the U.S.-Mexico border, and I think the testimony of the witnesses who preceded me indicates that the short answer to that question is yes. Firearms from the U.S. civilian gun market are fueling violence on both sides of our border with Mexico. 
If one wanted to design a system to pour military-style guns into criminal hands, it would be hard to find a better one than the U.S. civilian gun market. The only better way would be openly selling guns to criminals from the loading docks of manufacturers and importers. The U.S. gun market doesn't just make gun trafficking and military-style weapons to drug cartels and their criminal associates, including criminal street gangs in the United States. It doesn't just make trafficking in military-style weapons to them easy. It practically compels that traffic. Lax regulation of the U.S. gun market and the gun industry's ruthless design choices fit like gloves on the bloody hands of the drug lords and their criminal gang associates. The results are beyond debate. In February 2008, ATF Assistant Director William J. Hoover told another subcommittee, the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and I'm quoting excerpts from his testimony, Mexican drug trafficking organizations have aggressively turned to the U.S. as a source of firearms. The weapons sought by drug trafficking organizations have become increasingly higher quality and more powerful. These include the Barrett 50 caliber rifle, the Colt AR-15 assault rifle, the AK-47 assault rifle and its variants, and the FN 5.57 caliber millimeter pistols known better in Mexico as the Mata Policia or the cop killer. It is not a coincidence that gun smugglers come to the United States for these military style weapons. Guns like these are so easily available in such quantity that today they actually define the civilian gun market in America. I'd like to talk a little bit about regulation. The gun lobby and its advocates often says that the gun industry is heavily regulated. In fact, the gun industry in the United States is lightly regulated. The most important federal burdens on the gun industry are exercises in mere paper oversight, pro forma licensing, and rare inspections. Most states do not regulate dealers at all. The few that do rarely conduct regular inspections. In fact, ATF rarely conducts regular inspections. Gun sales themselves are subject only to the cursory background check under the federal Brady Law. And that is only required when the sale is made through a federally licensed gun dealer. We know, however, that 40% of all gun transfers in the United States, 40% are made through what's known as the informal market, that is, not through federally licensed dealers, over the back fence, through the newspaper. The major weakness of the U.S. effort against gun trafficking is its total reliance on after-the-fact law enforcement action. If, as some claim, traffickers indeed use a stream of ants to move guns to Mexico, it would seem to be more effective to make it more difficult for the ants to get the guns in the first place. That means looking upstream, and if we're gonna have a, a broad discussion of ideas, that's an idea we suggest. Look upstream to the gun industry to find ways to keep guns out of the hands of traffickers and their agents before they break the law. Now I've made reference to the military style designs that today define the gun industry the American civilian gun industry. The U.S. gun industry has been in serious economic trouble for decades. We at the Violence Policy Center have written about that at length, and I wrote the book Making a Killing about it. As the gun business publication's shooting industry, which is an industry publication, put it, more and more guns are being purchased by fewer and fewer consumers. In short, the markets are stagnant. The industry's principal way to jolt its weak markets has been to heavily push increasingly lethal gun designs to hook jaded gun buyers into coming back again to purchase something that's essentially utilitarian and never wears out. Because of these design and marketing decisions, the gun industry today is defined by military-style weaponry. Another industry publication, The New Firearms Business, wrote recently, the sole bright spot in the industry right now is the tactical end of the market, where AR and AK pattern rifles and high-tech designs are in an incredibly high demand. Now, one effective thing that could be done today without legislation, without new gun laws, would be for President Obama and Attorney General Eric Holder to direct the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms to strictly enforce its existing statutory authority 
to exclude from importation all semi-automatic assault rifles as non-sporting weapons pursuant to 18 United States Code Section 925D3. That's a provision of the 1968 Gun Control Act. It's been on the book for 40 years. I might point out that the first president, George Herbert Walker Bush, was the first president to use that provision to restrict the import of certain types of assault weapons, and that President Clinton expanded that approach during his term. The latter President Bush, George W. Bush, under his administration, uh, the ATF has apparently weakened this to allow the import of firearms, like the type on page two of my submitted statement, semi-automatic rifles, assault rifles seized in a gun smuggling case by ICE are from <coughs> our Romanian impo imports known as Wassers. This strict approach would start, stop the flow of assault weapons from countries like Romania, Many of those weapons move into criminal hands in the United States. The same Wasser-type gun has been used to kill U.S. law enforcement officers in Miami and elsewhere, and then across the border to Mexican cartels. This restriction could also be applied to other dangerous non-sporting firearms, such as the FN 5.7 handgun, the 5.7 millimeter handgun, specifically designed in Europe for use by counter-terror units against terrorists wearing body armor now freely marketed in the United States and known in Mexico as the Mata Policia, or the cop killer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Diaz. Thank all of your witnesses for your testimony. We're going to now engage in the, uh, the question and answer period, but five minutes uh, per member, and we'll do as many rounds as uh, we can all tolerate, and you have uh, time for as witnesses on that. Let me begin by uh, asking about the money on this, because I think Mr. Brown mentioned follow the money. Uh, is, a, is a way that people generally think of this. Twenty-eight to $25 billion of bulk money uh, traveling, I suspect, throughout the United States first before it then goes over to fuel this situation. Uh, many of us think of money laundering. We think of electronic wire and, and a lot of work that uh, Senator Kerry and others did years ago about the banking system. And I hear what you're telling us today is that now, uh, to counteract all the advances made there, they're just going back to cold cash and trying to bring that over. So I have a number of questions. One is, are they doing that in much the same way as uh, people say they're carrying the guns over the army of ants a little bit at a time, or are they bringing it over in huge truckloads? Uh, Mr. Brown? <clears throat> Innovative bunch of, uh, of smugglers here on, on both sides of the border. Uh, they're Mexican money laundering or financial cells uh, that collect remittances from uh, distribution cells all over the United States. They oftentimes cache that money um, in places like Atlanta, Chicago, hubs where they pull that money into. They'll repackage it, conceal it in, in vehicles, in vans, in automobiles. Sometimes they won't conceal it at all. Sometimes they'll simply stuff uh, duffel bags full of money and, uh, and send it south towards the border. Oftentimes, though, that money, once it reaches the southwest border of the United States, um, in, in uh, places like El Paso and Del, Re Del Rio and, and places in Arizona all along the southwest border. Oftentimes it will be cached uh, in, uh, in, in homes, safe houses uh, for the final count uh, before it's moved across, across the border. Uh, but as the chief of operations with DEA, just to kind of put this into perfect perspective, every morning I started uh, uh, with an 830 command uh, meeting in, uh, in our command center and was briefed by uh, what had taken place the, uh, during the previous 24 hours. There was, there, there was a never, never a week in the four years that I served as chief of operations that I can remember when there were not a number of million dollar, multi-million dollar uh, cash seizures throughout the United States. DEA, ICE, FBI just took down Operation Accelerator. You probably heard about it a few weeks ago. Uh, over $63 million, uh, mostly in cash, was seized uh, in, uh, in that investigation. One thing that I, I would like to, uh, to mention, um, many of the, the seizures that are made um, are, uh, are generated by judicial wiretaps uh, that DEA is conducting across uh, the United States. Uh, tremendous forms of, uh, tremendous forms of, uh, of, uh, of evidence gathering, uh, ability as, as, as well as uh, intelligence gathering. Uh, but but uh, uh, federal law enforcement is struggling with uh, what I believe to be some antiquated um, uh, legislation uh, and policies that, that, uh, that, that uh, deal with 
um, uh, federal law enforcement's ability to conduct judicial wiretaps. I'm not talking about the FBI FISA type, type stuff, uh, but with the ever emerging technologies, the FBI, DEA, we're having a tough time keeping up, keeping up with all this and uh, staying up on the phones that we need to be on. Well, thank you. We'll explore that further when we have the administration witnesses in as to what we might do uh, with regard to that. Uh, but Mr. Saley uh, was suggesting about this upstream activity, talking we have to improve the capabilities, uh, intelligence on matters in the in law enforcement side. But you also believe that right now the uh, Border Patrol, ICE, Drug Enforcement Agency, FBI and Treasury all have a piece of this action and your recommendation was that somebody be put in charge, somebody be tasked with actually coordinating all of that. Uh, who would you or Mr. Brown recommend be that person or, or that agency? Is there a preference there or does this matter that somebody do it? I know you have a strong opinion. Um, I, I agree with Mr. Mr. Seeley that we, we most definitely need to continue to follow the cash. The, prob the problem, uh, and, and we may not differ because we, we whispered back and forth a, mu a few minutes ago, and I think I may have turned Mr. Seeley around. I'm not sure. <laughs> but here, here's what interests me or what concerns me about putting one agency in charge of conducting kind of the financial investigative aspect of, uh, of, of global drug trafficking. We would never think of separating uh, the FBI's uh, uh, global war on terrorism responsibility. We would never, never think for a minute of separating the financial aspect and taking that away from the FBI and have them only focus on terrorism. So why in God's name would we consider doing that with respect to global drug trafficking? I, I guess I was misreading it then because I, I didn't read it as a recommendation that it be separated and given to one, but only that one be put in charge of coordinating oh, it. okay. I, and I, I, Mr. Saley, did I read it wrong? Or? No, no, that, that was the point. And, and I think it's more a question of coordination. I mean, clearly DEA is the lead in most things that involve drug trafficking. So I, mean, I think that is, other than when you get into money laundering where Treasury gets, that's highly involved. But m the question is more of coordination. And, and this is the kind of thing that lends itself very well, I think, to First of all, incentives. I mean, to, to what extent is the administration concerned about this as a key element in sending that message to key agencies? But secondly, what are the interagency mechanisms that allow intelligence to be shared? CBP knows a piece of this. I mean, there, there clearly is a border, as Jonathan has pointed, Patton, Mr. Patton has pointed out, there clearly is a question of border security here. CBP is clearly has, plays a role there. ICE plays a role in this as well. DA is perhaps the lead. FBI quite often knows pieces of this as well. Part of the question is how do we get these agencies talking to each other about right. this? And who would you think, what agency do you think would be the appropriate one to take the lead on that? I, I think it's a good question to ask the administration. Right. My sense you is DA no is probably is the lead on this de facto and they probably should keep that, but I think that's a good question to ask the administration. Right. My time has expired. I yield uh, five minutes to Mr. Flake. Thank the gentleman. Thank the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Seeley, you, you mentioned uh, three, three things, consumption of drugs, flow of money, and uh, limit uh, weapons coming into the U.S. to be exported to Mexico. You mentioned them one, two, three. Is that the order of importance you think they are in, in terms of combating what we're seeing there? Or would you rank them for me, for us? Uh, Congressman, I would actually, I would personally rank them that way. I'm not sure if other colleagues who participate in our report would have the same ranking. And, and let me tell you why I would rank them that way. Consumption from what we know from academic studies Reducing consumption is probably the most cost-effective way of reducing the overall market, disrupting the activities of, of drug cartels. We have the greatest bang for the buck. So I would start there as a key area. That said, nothing that we do, whether it is prevention programs or treatment programs, is going to reduce the market more than a percentage. I've heard people talk about 10 percent, I've heard 25 percent, but clearly it's not a solution in of itself. Secondly, I think uh, the mo interrupting the money flow is perhaps uh, the greatest global, we're, we're talking about, Cardiff, let's just put this in perspective, 15 to $25 billion, and, and no one knows the exact amount, but these are numbers that we put together sort of talking to a number of agencies. 15 to $25 billion, the Mexican government's budget for security is about three point, for organized crime is $3.9 billion a year, about $7 billion if you look at the global budget for law enforcement at the federal level in Mexico. This is a huge number. So disrupting that, and, and again, you're never going to disrupt more than a percentage of the money flow, but beginning to disrupt that is a key element of, of at least leveling the playing field here. And the third is the arms. And I, and I agree there is a border. Mexico can do much more on their side with the arms. But in the same way that we have been 
I, I say we've always expected Mexico to step up with drug traffickers that are trying to get drugs into this country on their side of the border. I think they have a legitimate right to look at us and say, you know, we should be doing our part on our side to make sure those arms are not getting exported. Clearly, they have a responsibility at the border, but, but we should do our part as well. It, and we don't want them turning around and saying, hey, the drugs are your problem. You're letting, you know, they're getting by the border. Right. No. Thank you. Mr. Payton, I appreciate, appreciate your testimony, particularly what I mentioned in my opening statement was that there are a lot of other things that we need to consider, and you raised some of those um, in terms of uh, numbers of or, or, or the, the burdens that are already uh, there in terms of what our U.S. attorneys have to deal with. Uh, you mentioned, uh, I'll ask you the, kind of, the same question that I asked Mr. Seeley, uh, of those items that you listed uh, in ensuring that we enforce our laws in terms of, of those entering Mexico, uh, burdens on U.S. attorneys, um, and the other issues, how would you rank them uh, for us? I mean, if, if, if it's our responsibility to allocate money and resources, um, because we all know, and Arizona is painfully aware, uh, the border, most of the issues dealing with the border are federal issues. And uh, so what can we do here? What is most important in your view? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Flake, I think that the Really, the, the, the biggest thing that we can do, as I said before, was my number one ranking, I guess, would be that we should focus on, on the infrastructure that goes along with the, uh, the border interdictions. And I mean the, the prosecutors, the judges, the defense attorneys. That entire infrastructure was left out when we added more Border Patrol agents. We have existing laws. We have straw purchase laws. We have, it is illegal to, to export guns that are illegal in, in Mexico, into Mexico. We, we have those things put in place. We simply don't have the, the ability to prosecute and jail those offenders because of all these other things. That would be the first <coughs> thing. I would also want to say that locally, because we've been waiting for the federal government to act, we've been trying to take matters into our own hands. And we found that the Department of Public Safety works quite well. Our, our state level police works quite well with ATF and other agencies. And the more that we empower them to, uh, to do some of these things, that's another set of resources that we can utilize that won't cost the federal government really that much more. We're trying to do that already in our, in our Senate Judiciary Committee. I'm working with different groups to try to uh, help enforce some of these existing gun laws. And I think that, first of all, is something we need to take care of before we do anything else. Thank you. Mr. Diaz, you, you talked about the importance of uh new gun laws, I guess, uh, or, or new classes of weapons to, to make illegal. Uh, what about the argument that Mr. Payton puts forward that we, we have difficulty with the resources and the, uh, the funding and everything to enforce <coughs> current laws on the books? Uh, yeah, wouldn't it be more difficult uh, to outlaw another class of weapons, or would that help at all? Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Flake. Um, I think first, you have to put the microphone I, I, on, Mr. Diaz. I'm sorry? Is that on your microphone? Or yeah, pull I think a it's on. Closer, if you would, thank you. All right, thank you for the question. Um, first, with respect to uh, enforcing existing laws, um, I think the record demonstrates that that's not enough. We're talking about a comprehensive solution. For example, the straw purchaser law, the federal law, and I know Mr. Payton is um, believes, or at least has said publicly, that maybe there should be also a state law, which is a new gun law. Um, in, in the state itself. The straw purchaser law, even in its best circumstances, if we said everybody obeyed the straw purchaser law, just, just as if we would hope everybody would obey the laws against consuming uh, illegal drugs, but let's assume that happened. That still leaves a very broad range of, of venues where firearms can be legally purchased without even worrying about straw purchasing. That's the 40% of the informal market I talked about. That's the, that's the uh, gun show problem. That's the uh, sales across the back fence problem. That's the internet uh, advertising problem. And, and the internet problem, some would say, well, in the case of an internet sale, you have to go through a dealer, not necessarily true. In a state as big as Texas, for example, you could do an intrastate sale consummated, consummated through the internet. So I think, um, yeah, we do need a, a comprehensive approach. And what I'm, the point I'm trying to make today is that there's a reason drug lords and terrorists want the specific kinds of firearms that the ATF trace data says they want. There's a reason they want them. 
The first reason is they do the job they want, which is killing police officers and killing each other to a large extent. The second is they're readily available in the United States. These semi-automatic assault weapons that come from, from Romania, the Wassers and so forth, um, the SKSs are cheap guns. It's, it's ideal for that traffic. So we're not, I, I, if you're asking me, would I like to see those guns outlawed, a new class of weapons outlawed? You bet I would. But what I'm suggesting today is there's a way to stop that traffic. The president could do it. The attorney general could do it by asking ATF to do what it's done in the past. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Lynch, we recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate yourself and the ranking member focusing on this issue. It's one that has not, uh, in recent times, received proper uh, attention. And uh, I want to thank the, the panelists as well. You've got a great group here. Uh, given the, the complete lawlessness that, that we've seen in Mexico, I, you know, I've been Googling uh, just phrases like uh, mayor assassinated in Mexico or police chief assassinated in Mexico. Uh, the lawlessness uh, in Mexico, and I'm not just, I, I realize this, this hearing is to look at our side of the border as well, but uh, I can't help but compare, uh, you know, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time in Iraq and, and Afghanistan, but especially in Iraq, and uh, the, the lawlessness and, and, and chaos that was there, uh, you know, in, from 2003 coming forward, there are some definite parallels here. And I know, Mr. Brown, you, you've, uh, you've had experience there as well. Uh, it would seem that, at least that is a threshold matter, uh, we need to have a situation in Mexico where the rule of law, their legal system, uh, allows the local population to have some confidence that with the proper application of the law, the bad guys can be taken off the street. And I'm not so sure, you know, just seeing the history here, that that exists. Uh, and, and it would seem that at some point we have to have the, a buy-in from the local communities there, the towns, villages, and cities, uh, that, that if they step up and cooperate, like the population did in Iraq in taking the bad guys off the street, uh, they need to have that confidence. Do, do we have that? Do we have that on, their, on, on the Mexican side of the border in any large degree? Right now, I don't believe we do have. Uh, and, and I don't believe um, there is a community in Mexico right now uh, where uh, the citizens have confidence in um, their law enforcement and other security personnel. I think that that one of the most important things um, that need to be done with respect to the Merida Initiative and the way that I believe um, a great deal of that money should be spent is on building uh, uh, a focus on building strong, lasting, professional uh, judicial institutions, fully vetted. In a place like Mexico, where corruption has permeated virtually every level of government, it is the only way that this can be turned around. So by a judi fully judicial uh, or fully vetted judicial paradigm is what I'm talking about is, look, you can have the best trained and the best vetted cops uh, that money can buy. But as part of the judicial process, if one or more prosecutors are corrupt, it all falls apart like, like, a, like a house of cards. Right. And if you've vetted and trained well your prosecutors, but you have corrupt judges. To take it another step, corrupt uh, penal institutions, it, it simply won't work. So right. you, you, you literally have to start from scratch and, and, and build fully vetted, and build a fully vetted judicial paradigm in, uh, in Mexico. I've talked to uh, Attorney General uh, Medina Mora many times about this. He's in full agreement. Uh, he and Hanaro Garcia uh, Luna, the um, the head of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, public security, of the public yeah public security, uh, who has the largest uh, uniformed uh, uh, you know federal law enforcement agency, 
uh, they're both in full agreement. They, they, they've started on their agencies, uh, and their plan is to, uh, to then uh, take it to, uh, to local and state law enforcement agencies after they've cleaned up, you know, after they've cleaned up their own houses. Can I add a point of fact to that, please? Uh, there, there is existing through the State Department a very small but real program to develop exactly what you're talking about, and it is operating in Mexico. It operated in Colombia, and I believe it actually operated in Sicily with the uh, several different uh, mafia factions, and it's specifically to build community support for rule of law. I don't want to go into the details, but this program does exist. You can find it through AID, mm -hmm. later I'd be happy to put in contact with specific mm -hmm. people doing it. And it may be an area where more support would make this program work better. Yeah, it, it must Thank be you. pretty nascent. I realize my time has expired. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much, Mr. Lynch. Uh, Mr. Fortenberry, you're recognized for five minutes. Yeah. Uh, he's going to. Mr. Chairman. Fortenberry, you want to yield to Mr. Micah? I'll yield to Mr. Micah. And then he'll yield back to you. Well, thank you, Ed. Um, appreciate your yielding, too. Uh, I did have the opportunity to chair uh, from 98 to 2000 the Criminal Justice Drug Policy Committee, which was eliminated uh, during the last uh, Congress. Uh, um, unfortunately, the other side of the aisle hasn't paid much attention to uh, this issue. I think Mr. Kucinich was the chair of that of the subcommittee. I guess it was dis domestic. <coughs> it got bounced to uh, dom domestic policy. Uh, lack of attention um, by this committee is not acceptable. I appreciate the uh, new chair starting this, and th this should only be the beginning. We need to haul in a Homeland Security, the ICE people, the CIA, FBI, um, the one of the last appointments in this administration is a drug czar, uh, and we need the drug, a, a drug czar appointed and confirmed. We need a full court press, because our neighbor to the south is about to lose its sovereignty. Uh, when I went down there, I went under heavy police guard as the chairman met in Mexico City, and I gave a, a, a speech to some of them, and I said, you're losing, your, you're gonna lose your damn country. I used that expression was behind closed doors. I was briefed by the CIA, I was briefed by the FBI and others before I got there. The level of corruption from the cop on the street to the president's office. And you hit it on the head. Uh, it, you, you have to, Mr. Braun, uh, the, play, the place has been corrupt and they're paying for it. You've got to have, Mr. Diaz said, the rule of, of law. Uh, and we've got to provide our friends to the south, our neighbor and neighbors, and we have millions of incredible Mexican Americans. I have uh, some in my family who are uh, just disgusted with what's going on, going on. And it's not just about guns, you know. They, and, and they've tried to do some things, but we've got to get them the resources to do this. Columbia lost control. We put Plan Columbia in. We gave them the resources. Work with Pastrana. He sang Kumbaya and uh, danced around. <coughs> Uribe came in and was tough. They killed thousands, just like they're killing in Mexico. But we've got to help them regain control with a plan and a policy of that country. Uh, it's totally out of control. It is a slaughterhouse, and it's on our borders, and it's spilling into our, our cities. So uh, I'm hoping this president, I, 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 I again, applaud you. But I want another hearing, and I want those people in that are going to run these programs and a plan to, to help the Mexicans regain control of that country. Uh, and it's not just to get about guns. And I've been with the gun route folks. Uh, uh, I'm telling you that the world is a, that Mexico's borders are a sieve and if they don't get them from the United States and it's not that we don't need enforcement we shouldn't have export or transport of, of weapons uh, but uh, we, we uh, you can't just control it on that part of its education uh, of the of people in the United States cut down the demand the talk of legalization and the Soros's and people uh, the biggest the biggest trans Trafficking is still um, is still marijuana, isn't that true, uh, Ron? Okay, it's, it's the most, yes. and the rest it's of it's transit. Drug. They don't produce any uh, 
uh, cocaine in Mexico that I know of. That there is an increase in heroin, uh, Mexican, but that's that's mark, U.S. market based. So we've got to uh, have a better education program to stop the uh, the demand. Um, everybody agrees with that. Just yes for the record. Uh, yes. But Mexico's turning in, is turning into a narco uh, state, and it's got it. We have got to have in place. Uh, zero tolerances. Let me take, give you an example about enforcement. If they don't do it in Mexico and we don't do it, tough enforcement of existing laws, and if we need other laws, uh, what happens? I dare you to go out here to First and C Street, right by, near the metro stop, I think it's First and C, and jaywalk when Officer Thompson's there. Have you ever seen Officer Thompson? He'll write you a damn ticket. He'll. He will, he will hold you accountable. So nobody, when he's there, violates the law. Rudy Giuliani worked with him. At New York City is still a safe venue because of zero tolerance. So we've got to, uh, we have got to uh, do everything we can to work with the, the Mexican officials. Uh, they, they have taken some steps, and I applaud them. They put the military there. And these pigs that would slaughter the military, I don't know if you, you read this story about a month ago, they killed seven of the military, and then they didn't use a gun, they used a knife to decapitate them. They put their heads in plastic uh, bags, uh, uh, clear plastic bags, and dumped them in a mall to set an example for others who cooperated uh, what they would do. These are, are the lowest scum of the earth, and they are, they're, kill, they're letting the drugs that come in and kill our people on our streets. So we've got to have a plan. Mr. Chairman, I, I request uh, our side will send you a letter this week. You're late. If you had been here at the beginning of the hearing, yeah. you would have heard that we've got okay. these things already planned. Uh, right. Again, Thanks. to, to uh, bring in whoever it takes, but we don't have a plan, to develop a plan and to follow through with that plan. I haven't seen the president's uh, budget and his items, but we'll work with him uh, and uh, work with whoever. I appreciate you all coming in today, and I appreciate again the chairman beginning the highlighting this, taking this back under control. I don't think I, I remember one single hearing there might, uh, on this issue during the last two years. But it's time we get engaged, and again, I applaud you for doing that, and we'll work with you. Yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Fortenberry, now you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for appearing today. Should National Guard troops be sent to the border? I, you know, I think the good thing that's happening right now is the cooperation between the United States and Mexico. We're, we're seeing, for the first time, a, a real scaling up of the kind of, of dialogue. And I, I think the hearing today is one of the examples of us talking about our responsibilities on our side. The Mexican government has, in a way that we've never seen before, picked up their responsibilities and said this is, is our issue. Not because, you know, we want to stop drugs coming to the U.S., but because it's a security issue for us. Sending the National Guard to the border, I think, sends the wrong message to Mexico. And I, and I think you would be wrong, seen. Wrong message? The wrong message. I think would be seen as moving against the cooperative spirit that we have right now and would probably reduce some of the very productive uh, engagement we have. One of the reasons, and this goes to something that Mr. Brown just said, one of the reasons why you're not seeing the killings going on on the U.S. side of the border is that Mexican's cartels know that they have very little chance of being thrown in jail for what happens on the Mexican side. The long-term solution to this is creating judicial system and police forces, particularly at a state and local level, that are capable of making sure that the traffickers have the same concerns on the Mexican side, that they are as careful as they are on this side about not uh, getting on the, not doing anything that calls the attention of the authorities. But in the short term, we have a government in Mexico right now which is trying to do the right thing, which is working very closely with the U.S. government. And I would say this cuts across party lines in Mexico. I mean, this is a, something that, that Mexicans have decided is a critical issue. This is President Calderon, but it's also a variety of parties. And anything that we do that, that is unilateral, seen as a unilateral step, is likely to undermine that. Um, and, and if I could just say something on the, the general situation in Mexico, I spent a lot of time in Mexico. <coughs> it's worth saying the country is not exactly in flames. I mean, there, there are three cities that really are in a very serious problem. Most places you're not worried about being killed when you walk out on the street. That said, you are worried about the fact that if something happens to you, 
you don't necessarily have police forces or a judicial system that's going to back you up that you trust. And, and that for a democracy in Mexico has, you know, nine years as a democracy is a critical question. And, and the question of whether this succeeds is a question of whether you build those institutions. And the Mexican government is trying to do it. There's a judicial reform. There's a police reform. There's some real efforts here, but it's the kind of thing we need to get involved in doing and do what we can do on our side as well. Senator. Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman, I would say Mr. Chairman, Congressman, I would say yes and no. We've had the, the National Guard on our border in Arizona. We, we had some uh, guard units from Utah and elsewhere that were there. They served in an auxiliary capacity. They, they assisted the Border Patrol, and I think they were very effective in doing what they did. I don't think it's a good idea to have U.S. soldiers patrolling with M16s and the rest. We need them um, elsewhere. And uh, as a soldier myself in the Army Reserve, I can tell you that many of those, those units are already deployed somewhere else, but we can certainly use them in an auxiliary capacity, and we're, we've done that effectively, and I think that it's affected our state dramatically when those, when those uh, guard troops were Well, maybe out. the question is a little too broad, and going back to what you, you said, Mr. Seeley, is, uh, and combined with what you're saying, Senator, there, there are three significant areas of difficulty, as you, you pointed out. Backup capacity until some of the ideas that you're discussing today, using the National Guard as backup capacity until sufficient local resources, national resources are augmented to bring the trouble spots under control. Is that perhaps a better way to, to think through uh, preventing an emergency cri type crisis that would spill over into the United States? Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman, I would say that it would be effective to have them in an auxiliary capacity, but the other problem, like I've, I've said before, is they're going to be catching people as they go through. They're going to be stopping uh, shipments of drugs and the like as they go through. The problem is, once again, is that infrastructure that goes along with it of prosecuting, convicting, jailing the offenders. All right, well, we let's have to that, that question, because that's the second part of my question. What are the common sense, simple initiatives, and Mr. Bronock, you can answer both of these if you like, that can be implemented quickly and uh, would have the most impact that are not currently being implemented? You made reference to one, how we don't uh, scan license plates to see if uh, they're stolen vehicles or not. Now, that, that would be, in my mind, at least a very simple thing to implement quickly and uh, be a part of a broader <coughs> book of uh, one chapter of a broad book of solutions. Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman, I would say that, that in that process, is there, inter is there, there has to be better coordination between those license plate readers and customs officials at the border and the Border Patrol officials. A lot of times they're going down I-19, they scan them, but they don't have enough lead time to, to let them know to catch the, the bad guys as they go through. I think, though, that that's the right idea, and I think if it was tried massively, the, the whole point is, is that we should be paying as much attention as people leaving the country as we're paying attention to people entering the country because they are largely the same people. And we, when we, we interdict them leaving, we're also finding that they, have, they're this, they pop up on our system for drug smuggling, other offenses, murders, rapes, et cetera. We can catch them then. And a lot of them are, are skips that they've, that they've committed crimes in the United States and they're fleeing the country. Um, to evade crime. Before, it, Prosecution. Mr. Chairman, do I, my time expired. It has expired. We're going to do Thank another you. round. Thank you. So, uh, and it won't be very long before we get to you again. And Mr. Burton, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I don't know how many hearings I've been to in my political career about this issue. I would imagine 100, 150. And yet you come again. This is wonderful. Yeah, I come again because, you know, because I'd like to, I really would like to find an answer. And, and you know, when, when you take an 18, 19-year-old kid and he's driving a brand-new Corvette with a gold dash and a wad of money in his hands that's maybe $10,000, $12,000 uh, in, a, in a city in the United States and, he, and uh, somebody arrests him or knocks him off and there's 10 guys waiting to take his place, it makes you wonder about uh, how you deal with that problem. I think, uh, and I hope, Mr. Chairman, we'll go down to the Mexican border. I'd love for you to have a hearing down there. I'd love to go with you down there and, and, and check some of the things that are going on firsthand. But uh, uh, let me just ask a couple questions. Senator, uh, you were talking about the turnstile down there, how people can just walk across the border coming from the United States so they can smuggle stuff in, which is dip more difficult, and then they take the money and just walk across the border so it's very easy for them to continue their business activities. Do you think that, it's, uh, that it would be wise for the President 
to say, okay, we're going to send the uh, send the uh, uh, National Guard and or the military. He could suspend policy comitatus if he wanted to to send the military down there. I know that's a dangerous thing, and most Americans don't want that to happen. But do you think that in certain <coughs> parts of the Mexican-American border, we ought to uh, we ought to do that, Mr. Chairman, Congressman? I would I would say that. Uh, to some extent, but as I said before, I think more in an auxiliary capacity to, to assist the Border Patrol that's already kind of familiar with the area and the terrain. Um, I think that would keep our soldiers um, uh, from getting into, into bad situations that they might do things like they would do in Iraq, but they might not be able to do here in the United States. I think that uh, furthering, um, encouraging Mexico to do something about their border security issue would assist us dramatically. Because, like I said, the, there are people smuggling and drug smuggling problem is their gun smuggling problem. Let, it's related. Let, let, me, let me just say, Mr. Chairman, over 70 percent of the people in prison in the United States, according to law enforcement officials, are there for drug-related crimes. It's costing thirty-five, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year to keep each one of those people incarcerated. It is absolutely breaking many states because there's so many people in, they can't keep track of them all, can't keep them incarcerated. They're letting them out because they're overcrowded and it's all drug-related crime. And I would just submit to you, I think drugs are the scourge of the earth. I think that anybody that deals in drugs ought to be put in jail permanently or killed. That's how bad I think drugs are. But as long as you can make the exorbitant amounts of profit, you're going to be able to bribe police, you're going to be able to bribe the, the public officials, you're going to be able to do all kinds of things. And unless the United States and Mexico and other countries are willing to make a complete commitment, like they have in some other countries in, in the world, and put these people away permanently, we're never going to solve the problem. I've been in government at the state and local level since 1967. And as I said before, I've been to over a hundred of these hearings. And every time I hear the same thing, you know, what we have to do, we have to put more money into law enforcement, we have to have uh, more help from our, uh, our neighbors, we have to police the Mexican-American border. And, and nothing ever changes except it gets worse. And so we in the United States have to come up with a plan that is so onerous that we scare the hell out of the drug dealers. And if we're not willing to do that, we're never going to solve the problem. And I'm talking about if they're arrested once, we, we give them a penalty. And if they're arrested twice, they spend the rest of their life in the slammer. And if they do something that involves somebody's life, we kill them. Now, if we're not willing to do that, in my opinion, we're never going to solve this problem, and it's going to continue to get worse. And until we really realize that, until we really come to grips with this, the problem is just going to get worse and worse and worse. And, 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 and any time we have a hearing, Mr. Chairman, and we listen to our witnesses, I've had, when I was chairman of this committee, I had the, the highest law enforcement people in the United States before this committee and asked them a number of questions, one of which was this. If you took the profitability out of drugs, what would happen? And they said, well, they wouldn't sell them. They said, you're not talking about legalizing them, are you? I said, no, of course not. I want anybody dealing with drugs to be punished to the full extent of the law, and even more so. But the point is, as long as you can take something that costs $100 and sell it for $10,000, you've got a big problem. Because there's more and more people that are going to jump into it, and you, it's very difficult to get rid of them. And so I'd just like to say that we in the United States have to make a complete commitment to dealing with the drug problem, and I mean severe commitment, putting people away, giving them the death penalty, life imprisonment after a second offense, not a third offense. And until we're willing to do that, in my opinion, we're never going to solve the problem. And I hate to get emotional about this, Mr. Chairman, but when I see uh, people I know uh, and their kids dying because of drugs and going to jail because of drugs because somebody got them into it, it becomes a personal thing. And, and we really have to make a, 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 a very committed effort to deal with the problem and just doing what we're doing right now will never solve it, in my opinion. But I do hope we hold, have hearings down the border. Thank you. We, we will. And I, you know, I, later on, I'm going to ask a question uh, that emanated from reading The uh, Economist this week. I don't know if people read it or not about taking the profit out of it. And, and if you're still here, I'd love to get your reaction to that. Um, but at this point, let me ask, uh, you know, it's sort of a red herring here. Whenever we try to narrow down and focus on just a couple of issues, this one being the money uh, that's being brought over hard <laughs> cash, uh, the idea of maybe trying to lessen demand 
uh, through education or whatever, or even deal with some of the high-powered weapons that are really giving them the power to, to force corruption uh, on people or to scare them into it. Some people want to say, oh, gee, you know, like we're just focusing just on that and it's a bigger problem. We understand it's a bigger problem. Uh, and there are other committees dealing with other parts of it and we'll deal with other parts of it. But we need a comprehensive approach. And the things we're talking about today, I think, are significant. I, I guess you do too. You wouldn't be here talking about them. But uh, I don't think we just dismiss it by saying, oh, you know, it isn't guns or it isn't money or it isn't lessening demand. It's those things as well as addressing the corruption as well as the rule of law questions and the infrastructure that Senator Payton, I think, rightfully brings up here. And I think that's something I hope our Judiciary and Appropriations Committees listen to and we'll share that with them. It's also controlling the border and enforcing existing law uh, and also interdicting transshipments and things of that nature. But it also is the things we're talking about today, including, uh, you know, the, the high-powered weapons that are being used. I mean, it's, the intimidation is a big factor in getting the corruption. Would you agree, Mr. Brown? Uh, and you've all, several of you have served over in Iraq or Afghanistan. This is what you get to go over there and fight uh, terrorism. Uh, the extremists and things of that nature, this is what you get. I don't know the justification for having a civilian arms market selling to <laughs> civilians this kind of weaponry and that kind of a gun. This isn't for, you know, uh, for civilians to fight a war. This is what, for hunting or for sport? Uh, uh, Mr. Diaz, Mr. Payton, I mean, uh, you know, maybe Mr. Payton, you want to start because the first thing that you were talking about is, oh, we don't need more laws, we don't need to control. Why don't we need to keep this from the civilian market? Mr. Chairman, um, in answer to that question, I guess I would ask the same question about grenades and uh, M16s and AK-47s and other things that, are, I, that so are already illegal. Feel free to answer them all. And they're still, and Mr. Chairman, they're still being sold and bought in Mexico. Mexico has all of these laws that, that have been talked about, has done them no good. Well, they Mr. have 15 Payton, 90 years. 90 percent of them are coming from this country. Mr. Chairman, Mexico has a 15-year um, sentence for possession of some of these weapons, and they have not been able to stop them. But we've talked about the we can stop problems that well. they're having with their law enforcement. We all admit that they need to have enhanced law enforcement, that they have trouble with the judiciary system, trouble with corruption, trouble with all of that. We're talking about this country. Why is it that it's so easy for them to come to this country and buy something of this size and bring it back over there? And Mr. Diaz, why don't you give it a shot? Um, I think it's, a, it's an ideal subject to talk about this comprehensive problem. Uh, Mr. Payton brought up several times uh, the question of what we would call military armament, mm -hmm. stuff that's already illegal, not only in Mexico but in the United States, fully, auto, fully automatic machine guns, hand grenades, rocket launchers. Uh, those things are indeed showing up in Mexico. Um, here was a big raid um, um, in, in Reynosa back in, I guess, last November. And yeah, uh, grenade launchers, law rocket launchers, 278 grenades. But here's where the integration comes to this. And in addition, I might point out, seven Barrett 50 caliber sniper rifles, fully legal in the United States. The, the Barrett sniper rifle, the, the gun that fires that kind of ammunition, and the one in display out here is simply a knockoff. Um, uh, it's, it's an AR-50. People said, oh, Ronnie Barrett's got a great idea here. Let's make our own. Um, that's a civilian weapon, very attractive to the gun runners. Um, the um, so-called Mata Policia, the Herstal handgun, also shows up in this raid. So the point is, they want both. They want the military weaponry and they want the civilian weaponry. Now, what ties them together? I would make the argument that what allows criminals to exercise force, and here I'm talking about the gang problem in the United States, is firearms. Whether it's a running gun battle that went for two blocks in the city of Los Angeles between a, dr a drug gang, guns give the power of force to these criminal organizations. Now, we know that from reports published by the National Gang Intelligence Center that one source of these military-style weapons that are showing up in illegal traffic are gang members in the military. The, my point is that this is all a related problem. I understand it's not only firearms, but firearms are the force, the force leverage that we talk about. They make gangs, the street gangs like MS-13, Mara Sabatrucha, uh, 18th Street that are heavily integrated into these drug organizations. They give them the power to control neighborhoods in the United States. They give them the power to control corridors. They give them the power to be the foot soldiers for these people. So it's an integrated problem. It's not just 
military weaponry or civilian weaponry. These 50 caliber rifles that do the job, in my opinion, they should not be available for unfettered sale to civilians. Now, what the Violence Policy Center has recommended is, let's treat them as the weapons of war that they are. Let's bring them under an existing law, which is called the National Firearms Act, under which machine guns, fully automatic weapons, hand grenades, rocket launchers, and other weapons of war are regulated. It's a stricter regimen. They're harder to buy. It took me about six hours to legally buy that gun and register it in the District of Columbia after I found it on the internet to make the point that in the nation's capital where there are so many high profile targets, it's, it could legally be purchased. Not only could that gun be legally purchased, but armor piercing, armor piercing incendiary, ammunition for that gun could legally be purchased and shipped through ordinary parcel post. Now, the law in the District of Columbia has been changed, and that gun has about a three-year lifespan before it has to be gotten rid of. But, but the point is, civilian, some civilian military-style weaponry, which has become the focus of the American civilian gun market now, is every bit as deadly, every bit as desirable, every bit as power enhancing as the military stuff, and it's a lot easier to get. Why wouldn't you come to the United States and go to a gun show and buy one of these? You can go to any gun show in America, I guarantee you, and see something like this on the table, and probably not being sold by a dealer, which means you don't have to worry about the so-called straw buyer. You don't have to worry about the background check. You walk out in the parking lot and say, I like that. I want five more of them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Diaz. Mr. Flake. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Seeley, or I'm sorry, Mr. Brown, you, you mentioned uh, that the Mexican government can win this war on the cartels. Uh, what kind of time frame uh, are we looking at here? Uh, there's some, and you mentioned it's kind of a perfect storm now with, with everything going on that's causing the violence. Uh, how, if, if the Calderon government had just said, we're going to take the position that the last government did and not confront these cartels, would we be seeing this level of violence? Or how much is this a result of the stepped up enforcement action on the part of the Mexican government? And then uh, as, as far as a time frame, when you think this, this can be won, or is it going to require more cooperation from us uh, like we have in Colombia? Uh, Congressman, I, I, look, it's it's uh, it's going to take a lot more cooperation from from us and and help um, in in the way of uh, of both um, uh, funding and um, and and uh, expert uh, advice, guidance, mentoring, and that kind of thing to our um, not only to our Mexican law enforcement personnel, but but uh, their military forces as well. Uh, you know, I. I wish I could answer the first question is when, when is this going to all end? If I could do that, uh, our newly formed company could probably go from the red into the black very quickly. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I uh, honestly believe that uh, it, it's going to get worse before it gets better, uh, just as it did in Colombia. Uh, but I believe uh, wholeheartedly that, uh, that Mexico is already beginning to turn the tide, um, but, but you know they've they've got another uh, probably year and a half, two years, um, uh, a minimum uh, that uh, uh, that that you know there's there's going to be a lot of conflict going on. I I don't know if it's going to be as bad as it currently is, um, uh, but it's it's uh, you know there's a lot to unfold uh, yet. With that said. Um, the second part of your question, had this gone unchecked? Uh, I, I'm telling you, based on what I know and the high-level folks that I've talked to from Mexico, President Calderon, after being advised by you know, his security advisors and others, <clears throat> uh, came to the same decision that a lot of other <clears throat> high-level folks in Mexico did. If they didn't take this on, uh, Mexico was going to devolve into a narco state with, you know, before the next decade. And uh, General McCaffrey's report uh, recently in his study uh, came to that same conclusion. So, you know, as is, is hard as this is to grasp 
as hard as it is to stomach and as hard as it is for me to say, uh, I believe uh, what we're seeing here um, with all of this you know, carnage is really a product of, of the success of the strategy. The cartels have never been pressed and never been pressured like they have been over the past two years. And they will, uh, they will ultimately fold if we, help, uh, if we help our Mexican counterparts. If we don't help them, um, th there's a chance they could lose this. And if they lose it, it's going to, you know, that, 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 you know, our mistake will cut deep into, uh, in, into both sides of the border, into our national security, into our economies, into our cultures. Mr. Payton, I was interested in your discussion of uh, going down to Mexico and uh, looking at some of these uh, uh, cooperative agreements that we have there. Uh, is it your view that, they, that the Mexican government is, is anxious to cooperate with us and anxious to, to welcome our assistance? Uh, I, a lot of people are under the misimpression that we give uh, foreign aid to Mexico. Uh, our aid to Mexico is in the form of uh, drug interdiction and cooperation and, and other things. Uh, is this working, have they been cooperative enough with us in that regard? Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Flake, my visit with the uh, Mexican officials, and, and we're also trying to put on our own a field hearing of our judicially hold a committee hearing in Sonora, Nogales, Nogales, Sonora, on this very issue. They are very interested in working with us. I think they've been extremely courageous to stand up um, and fight the cartels as they have. Some of them, some of them obviously are, are, are suffering from corruption and, and the, the problems that, that go on there. But I think that rather than just looking at it as, as foreign aid, I would, I would say that whatever agreements we can use, in them in our own um, evidence collection techniques and the rest will benefit us in intelligence gathering in the United States, much the same way when, when I serve in Iraq, um, we work with the Iraqi military and the Iraqi police we glean that intelligence that we were able to use in our own in our own capacity. We could do that in the United States. So it would be actually benefit us in the long run rather than just benefit them. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, you know, it's too bad that uh, Mr. Micah had to leave because uh, somebody just handed me a report. He was asking about the Obama administration's approach. Apparently there was an article in today's paper where he was quoted as saying he expects to have a comprehensive approach to dealing with issues of border security that will involve supporting Calderon and his efforts in a partnership also making sure we're dealing with the flow of drug money and guns south because it's really a two-way situation there. So uh, we'll certainly explore that more when we have our own hearings on that, but that's an indication of the direction. Let me uh, just – that article that was in The Economist that I referenced in my opening remarks is uh, – sort of goes beyond where Mr. Burton was, but I, I want to bring it up a little bit. Um, and I'm going to describe, give you a little book report on the premise and just get reactions on this. Uh, the premise has much to do about the fact that this is such an, a, uh, a lucrative illegal industry for people, that there's a $322 billion a year, and obviously people will fight to the death to protect that kind of profit. So the article says first that since the first international effort to ban trade in narcotic drugs, which was in 1909, the article says the effort has failed. It recounts the 1998 UN promotion by 2008, that is the production of opium, cocaine, and cannabis, and it says that has failed. It says, even if the claim that close to half of all cocaine produced had been seized, the street price in the United States does not seem to have risen. It claims that the market has stabilized, it said, but it means that more than 200 million people, 5 percent of the world population, still take illegal drugs. That's about the same proportion as took illegal drugs a decade ago. It says the United States spends $40 billion a year trying to eliminate drugs. It says the United States arrests 15 million, dollars, 15 million people per year in drug-related offenses and jails a half a million of them. The Economist claims that the struggle has been illiberal, how unusual for The Economist, <laughs> murderous and pointless. It said the prohibition vitiates the efforts of warlords. It said the street price is more involved with the risk of getting drugs into Europe and the United States and that even if the source is disrupted, Business adapts to a new location. And that talks about Afghanistan being a failed state and, and drugs moving from there. It talks, uh, it, I guess it references South America, where it might go from Peru to Bolivia to Colombia. Wherever you push it at one point, it goes to another. Uh, and, that, and, and their fear is, of course, that the drug uh, gangs will team up with the terrorists and the money will get together and it'd be a problem. This is $320 billion a year in illegal drug industry. 
uh, results in weapons, terror, and corruption. And then it talks about five different things. Shifting the focus to prevention and treatment, maintaining an effort to interdict and go after traffickers, banning a sale to minors, decriminalizing, regulating, and taxing, and taking the profit out of the illegal industry, and then using those revenues and savings to guarantee treatment. Can I just have the reaction from left to right on folks there? Mr. Seeley. Well, I, I think they've hit some of the major points. I, th there is de facto a bit of decriminalization going on in this country, a number of states actually. In fact, the Economist article cites this, the, a number of states r really don't enforce particularly uh, small-time use of, of some narcotics. Um, I think it's worth studying and seeing what the effect of that is on the overall market, if that's being successful. I don't think there is a serious debate in this country right now in legalization. We could debate philosophically whether we think there should be or not. But we do have some experience with decriminalization, just simply states that have decided, and, and in fact, uh, Seattle, where our new director of the ONDCP is, or Desen is coming from, is one of the areas that has tried to decriminalize some small-time use. It's worth studying and seeing whether that is effective. I would certainly say the other elements, investing in treatment and so on, is, is uh, these are the ways to go. Investing in treatment, investing in um, enforcing where the, the harm is greatest, that is the way to go. And if I could, Mr. Chairman, just say something very quickly on, on a question you raised earlier and something about uh, President Obama's statement yesterday. I think one of the key questions on coordination on this, not on the money laundering piece, but on the broader question with Mexico, is this may be the kind of thing where the NSC is particularly, uh, our domestic policy and foreign policy networks in the government, this may be the kind of issue which is high enough level you can only begin to get the kind of comprehensive approach you're talking about and that President Obama was talking about if there is leadership from the White House saying let's pull together Homeland Security, let's pull together Justice Department, State Department, everyone has a piece of this larger Defense Department. There are pieces of this that everyone is doing and doing well, but if, unless we do it together in a more coordinated way, I don't think we get to the right solution we want. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, listen, with respect to um, just legalization, it, it's um, the old saying, uh, you know, we're, we're doomed to repeat uh, history if we, don't, if we don't know it, if we're not aware of it. The worst period in our nation's history with respect to drug abuse was that 30 to 40 year period after our Civil War the soldier's disease. You could walk into any drugstore in our country and you could buy cocaine, morphine, heroin, or opium off the shelf because it was unregulated. The hue and cry went out to your predecessors back in those days that the federal government had to step in and do something about it and regulate this stuff and, and somehow uh, get some kind of a control on it because it was ripping apart the fabric of our country uh, one fa family after another. There's not been one country any, anywhere in the world that has decriminalized drugs, even marijuana, that didn't eventually recriminalize drugs because workplace incidents of, of injury skyrocketed. Drug drivings, uh, incidents of drug driving and, uh, and, and, uh, and highway accidents and deaths skyrocketed. Uh, school equivalency and efficiency tests plummeted. Uh, I mean, I, I could go on and on. There's plenty of history that, that clearly shows legalization uh, will not work. You can't tell that I'm passionate about this. I trust well, you'll be sending a letter to The Economist. <laughs> <laughs> well, going back to The Economist, just, just one other piece. The, the, the evidence is in. We are experiencing, uh, I, I think we're now into just beyond the two-year mark of significant continued incre increases in price of both cocaine, he's on the heroin now in our country, and continued significant decreases in purity. A lot of that has to do with President Calderon and what's going on in Mexico. A lot of it has to do with what's happening in, uh, in Colombia and what's happened in, in Colombia over the last several years. And there are some other dynamics at play here as well. Uh, but, but those are the facts. Thank you. I can interrupt you. To <coughs> Senator, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to say uh, in reference to that, in my own state, I, I conducted extensive hearings on Child Protective <coughs> Services. And the statistic that I was given from Child Protective Services was this, 95% of the removals for ch children who were abused or neglected by their parents were methamphetamines related. It is not a victimless crime. And the bottom line is, is if they decriminalize that, 
you're going to see more child abuse, you're going to see more uh, problems with those children. Six children in my, in my district in a one year's period of time were killed by their parents. All six cases had one thing in common, methamphetamines. And in one of the cases, the, uh, there was a, a, a little girl, her body was found in a storage facility in Tucson. Her brother, they couldn't find that body. And the, uh, the, the accused said in the interrogation, if you give me meth, I'll tell, me, I'll tell you where, where I put my son. That's, that's the effect the drugs are having. That isn't the illegal buying or selling. That's just the using, the effect that it's had in my district. And I can tell you that we have a meth methamphetamine epidemic. It used to be made in, in the United States and Arizona. Now it's being made in Mexico. And those precursor chemicals are being shipped from China and elsewhere into uh, Mexico. And they're flooding our, our state. And I can tell you that it's killing children in, in my, uh, my own district. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Diaz. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The thing I find most encouraging about this hearing is that, uh, as Mr. Flake said, it's opening a broad discussion of ideas. There's a whole spectrum of things you could talk about, about drugs, which drug policy has been sort of the third rail of what elected people all over the country are willing to talk about. I think it's encouraging to see that that might be a subject of discussion. It, it put me personally in mind, there was a, a man named Herman Kahn who uh, wrote a book called On Thermonuclear War. He's a famous nuclear strategist. And he, he wrote about uh, something that was called the white slave problem in Victorian England. And essentially what it was, women were being kidnapped off the streets of London and taken, put into uh, the prostitution traffic, just as we today have sex traffic. But nobody knew about it because in Victorian society you couldn't talk about it. So he, he, he in thermonuclear war, talked about thermonuclear war. And, and people said that was thinking about the unthinkable. So he wrote his next book and titled it Thinking About the Unthinkable. So I think it's great that um, committees like this are willing to engage this question. And there's a whole spectrum. It's not just legalization. But I do know that drugs do drive the, the things that I know about. They drive the criminal street gangs with the primary, primary retail distributors. So something has to give here. Uh, the second thing I think it's, as several of the speakers before me have pointed out, it's a hydraulic system. Whether it's enforcement, we break down, we we stop the movement of drugs through the through through Florida, and and the, and, the, and they end up moving through Miami. Same thing with guns, um, may, maybe. And I, and I hope that uh, Senator Payton's uh, straw purchaser law will 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 be more effective in Arizona. But um, you know, we've got 50 states and lots of other places, so it's a hydraulic system. And I like the fact that you're willing to look at all of those integrated. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Diaz. Mr. Flake. Mr. Fortenberry. Thanks again, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to follow up on the previous questions that I'd asked. Uh, Mr. Braun, you didn't get a chance to answer. The reason I raised the issue of uh, National Guard troops to the border is that it, clearly it's been raised elsewhere and, and may come to dominate this discussion in the coming days or weeks. Again, an opinion on that, but going back, the second phase of the question is, what are the simplest things that can be done first, implemented easily, that will have maximum impact? Uh, we talked about this issue of what seems to me to be quite simple, one of technology monitoring traffic for stolen vehicles going out of the country. Uh, that, that clearly would, at least in my view, be easy to implement. But we've talked about a range of things today, including interdiction, law enforcement, increased detention capacity, border control, social programs, and diplomatic initiatives, which have to be uh, a part of this entire continuum, and I agree with that. But again, Mr. Burton said I've had 150 hearings on this. Uh, similar problem, growing, perhaps in intensity. What are immediate steps that can be taken that perhaps are most simple, but can be leveraged for, ma or perhaps are somewhat simple, but can be leveraged for maximum impact quickly? <clears throat> uh, Congressman Fortenberry, th thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to, to talk about the National Guard and our military. Um, <clears throat> the National Guard, there is a role for the National Guard, and in fact, the National Guard has supported DEA. Pull, pull the mic a little closer to you, if you would, please. I'm sorry. Thank there you. is a role for the National Guard, and the National Guard has supported DEA for many, many years. They have provided us uh, with additional intel analysts that we needed along the border. They have intelligence analysts assigned to the El Paso Intelligence Center, just as our uh, Department of Defense does. Uh, they bring to bear uh, some, uh, some, some very high-tech uh, equipment, seismic um, technology to identify, locate and identify those tunnels. 
that pose uh, such a, a real threat to our national uh, security uh, on, the, uh, on the southwest border. Uh, so they are engaged and they are involved. They have been for a long time. Um, I, would, uh, I would agree with Mr. Patton, though. Um, <clears throat> having National Guard or military, uh, our military in uniform, uh, armed uh, on the front lines on our border, I think, uh, uh, you know, poses some major issues. I believe you'll probably all recall the very tragic incident outside of El Paso about 10 years ago uh, when a, um, a, a young Marine who was on a uh, just simple observation, uh, performing simple observation uh, duty, uh, confronted um, uh, a young kid uh, that was uh, actually, as I recall, hurting hurting goat herder mm -hmm. and uh, who was armed with a 22 rifle and the kid pointed it in the wrong direction and he paid for it with his life and uh, and, and that turned into um, uh, well j just just a, a you know a, a very uh, 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 you know tough thing for both of our our countries to uh, to manage and, and deal with both the United States and Mexico so I, I'm just you know I'm just saying that we've got to be you know very cautious and and, and prudent and judicious with how we use our, our military folks. Some short-term solutions, uh, I, I agree with you. I think technology brings a lot to the table. The LPRs are the license plate readers. Um, DEA uh, uh, has worked very closely with CBP in Texas, uh, and I believe also in, uh, in Arizona, Mr. Patton. And, uh, uh, and Mr. Flake, and uh, with tremendous results. What needs to be done, I believe, is, well, the way they work best, obviously, are at the Border Patrol checkpoints that are 20 or 30 miles inland uh, before those vehicles make it to the POEs. You've got time to, they've got time to, to, to flash the plate, um, uh, you know, using technology, make the inquiry, and then determine if the vehicle uh, or driver of the vehicle, not, not particularly the driver of the vehicle, but registered owner of the vehicle might be suspect or have, has shown up suspect in some uh, activity in the past. Those things um, on kind of a pi on pilot programs have, have uh, I'm, I'm telling you what, it's good stuff, good technology, uh, and I believe we could make and need to make much better use of it. With respect to LPRs, though, I would simply say that, you know, as we've seen so many times in the past, uh, you've got, uh, you know, DEA with their interest. You've got uh, ICE with their interest. You've got CBP with their interest. Uh, someone needs to be placed in charge of this, this effort. Uh, if we're all out there buying these things, we ought to at least be buying the ones that we can integrate together and into one system uh, that, uh, that the information can then, then be quickly and, uh, and very effectively shared as Mr. Seeley and Mr. Patton have both brought out, you know, that point earlier. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Flake. I've got to run to the floor, unfortunately, now, and I think we're about to end, but um, I just wanted to say in closing, um, I appreciate uh, this has been a very illuminating hearing and appreciate all of you for your, your testimony. And uh, I'll just end with one thing I started with. Uh, I, I hope that we can, and this is only a federal issue, we've got to do this in Arizona. Uh, we're in a, in a bad way because of the federal government's failure to adequately secure the border. But uh, one thing that would help would be have, to have comprehensive immigration reform and have a meaningful temporary worker program where uh, legal workers can come and go. Uh, and uh, when we've had other versions of that, and we don't want to recreate the Becerro program, believe me, but mm -hmm. uh, when you have a legal framework for people to come and go, uh, then you can free up the resources that we desperately need to build the infrastructure that uh, Senator Payton, Payton talked about uh, to adequately deal with this issue. So I hope that we can we can uh, get off the dime on a number of issues here at the federal level and, and uh, to improve the situation. But uh, this has been a very good hearing. I thank the chairman for calling it. Thank you, Mr. Flake. And again, thank all of you for your contribution here today. I think we've got an idea of some things we should pursue from technology uh, on the border to infrastructure investments that need to be done towards at least addressing uh, the idea of what nature of uh, guns are going south and what we might do to uh, to lessen that, both in the quality and, and uh, kind of gun they're going down, as well as the numbers and the money. 
uh, and of course the usage of, uh, of the consumers on this end. So thank every one of you for your contribution. I leave you only with one request that you needn't comply with because I don't have any right to give you homework. But one area that we didn't get into was precursors, although we mentioned it at a couple of points. If any of you have information that you think the committee uh, should focus on or have their attention drawn to about the role of precursors coming in, uh, where do they come from? Where do they transit on the way through? Is there a role for the United States at all to be involved with trying to uh, deal with that issue? We'd certainly appreciate it. We'll share it with the other members on that. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Flake. The meeting adjourned. Do you pronounce your name? Aiden? Aiden. Jack McClinton counters with 20. The ACC tournament tips off next. Feels big, plays big, costs little. This spring, play three days and add Tuesday for free on Alabama's Robert Trent Jones Golf Trail. Choose from 26 courses and get ready to swing. Come see why Golf Digest says the trail is the number one value in the country. Call or go online today to plan your big trip for Little Doe. Um, don't look, but you're totally getting scoped out right now. Seriously, where? Don't look. Been staring at you for like 20 minutes. <laughs> what, that? That's the money you could be saving with Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. At Chrysler and Jeep, we're working to earn your trust in your business by delivering the best quality and reliability in our history. And now Four years later, Wake up. Cindy has become Miss March. We're going to Playboy Mansion. Rated R. Judge Joe Brown, weeknights at 6.30 on My20. This week, there's three asks. Which IT buzzwords annoy you most? Enterprise. Enterprise this, enterprise that. And whenever an IT person says it, which is like every five minutes, I think, man, y'all belong on a Starship Enterprise. Scotty, beam these guys up. Please, get them out of my office. It takes more than buzzwords to manage your data center. We help people optimize their data centers, and we do it in English. Force 3. Networks are people. Force 3 is a leading provider of Cisco to the federal government. From Jennifer, get two microfiber recliners for just $2.99. It's the lowest price ever. That's both recliners for $2.99. Stylishly affordable. Only from Jennifer. You don't have to spend a lot to have good taste. The ACC Tournament on WDCA, brought to you locally by BMW. Tomorrow. We're going to the Playboy Mansion. Get on the bus. Look at me. This is a party bus. There's only one rule. You got to party. You like this? Then come and get it. Miss March. Rated R. In theaters tomorrow. ACC Basketball is being brought to you by Pepsi, by Verizon Wireless, by your Carolina Chrysler dealers, by Bud Light,
by RBC Bank. By Gillette Fusion. And by Food Lion. ACC Basketball is presented in high definition. We're available by MFS Investment Management, a diverse range of products so advisors can choose what fits. Gorgeous day in Atlanta. And the Georgia Dome, spectacular for this first matchup, the 56th annual Atlanta Coast Conference Tournament, Miami and Virginia Tech. Welcome inside, everybody. Tim Brand along with Dan Bonner. Dan, you couldn't ask for a more athletic, exciting matchup right out of the gates than Virginia Tech and Miami, which went overtime the first time they met. Well, they sure did, and you also can't ask for a more important matchup. I think both of these teams understand very clearly that the loser is probably going to the NIT. Absolutely. The third member of our broadcast team, Scott Przewanski. Scott, what do you have? Well, guys, Miami's Jack McClendon is the model student athlete. Moments ago, he received the second annual Skip Prosser Award for academic and athletic achievement, better than a 3.0 GPA for McClendon. And, of course, for the second straight season, he was voted first team all ACC. This guy can flat out play. There's no doubt about it. Of course, in the ACC, he ranks first in a field goal percentage for shooting from beyond the arc, better than 44%. But what really makes him special, I think, is his ability to make games changing uh, shots during the ball game and Virginia Tech is going to have to know where he is on the court without a doubt throughout this entire ball game especially gentlemen if this one's a tight one all right Scott thank you very much Dan take us through the four keys to the game if the University of Miami is going to hit that road to the final four Jack McClinton is going to have to be at full strength he's been bothered by a knee injury he says he's okay and besides if they're going to do that, he's going to need a little help from his friends. And for the Virginia Tech Hokies, they need their three big dogs to be barking. The last time these teams played, Basayo, Delaney, and Allen combined for 74 of Virginia Tech's 88 points. If Tech's going to hit on all cylinders, the big three all have to play well. Miami lost to Virginia Tech 88-83 in overtime January 25th. Take a look at our food line starting lineups and start with the Canes. All eyes will be on Jack McClinton, the 6'1 senior from Baltimore, Maryland. First team all ACC for the second straight year, along with Collins and Asbury, Dews, and Graham. For Virginia Tech, they come in with a record of 17 and 13, 7 and 9 in the conference. A.D. Visayo, Allen, and uh, Delaney are called the big three, along with Sheck Jaquite and uh, Hudson. So there is your starting five. We're all set to go. The officials for the first game, Brian Kersey, Jamie Lucky, Raymond Stiens. 56th annual Atlantic Coast Conference basketball tournament coming your way from the Georgia Dome. This is fun. Everybody's been talking about what a great tournament this has the potential to be simply because of how competitive the conference has been all season long. And as we just mentioned, Tim, you really can't ask for a better first matchup in the game. Two teams desperately needing to win. The last meeting was a tremendous game one with a Malcolm, the amazing Malcolm Delaney three-point shot right at the end in overtime. It was one of those games where McClinton would hit a big three, Delaney would come back with one. Asbury would step up with a big dunk, A.D. Vasayo would respond. Tremendous game. Got a hold up here. Got a little bit of a shot clock violation or a situation with the shot clock anyway. Look at Seth Greenberg in his sixth year at Tech. Won 105 games while in Blacksburg and Frank Haith in his fifth year at Miami and surpassed expectations, bringing the Canes into national prominence. It has been a rather disappointing season for Miami. They were ranked in the top 20 to start the season, but they certainly have the talent and now the opportunity to make up for any lost time during the regular year. Well, the Hurricanes will have it 